Our next speaker from Derrida, Louisiana, someone very special that's here in Little Rock. And I met him for the first time at the Texas Free Thought Convention in 2011, just barely a year ago. He was one of the first people I met, actually. I didn't know a soul there, and uh, uh, there was a spot at a table I sat down and uh, overheard him talking a little bit about his, um, his experience and was just fascinated. So I was lucky that there was a free spot. It's probably the last time I'll ever find an empty chair next to Jerry DeWitt. At the time, he had just left his 25-year career as a Pentecostal minister, but was still in the closet as an atheist out of concern for his current job and family. He soon after earned the distinction of becoming the first graduate of the clergy project created by Richard Dawkins and Dan Barker as a safe private community for former and current clergy members who no longer held supernatural beliefs. Jerry then became, uh, became involved with recovering from religion with Dr. Daryl Ray, author of The God Virus, and his, time, uh, his tireless assistant, Sarah Moorhead, where he can also help laypersons ease into the transition away from faith. And Jerry's done a lot of that. He's donated a lot of time to people who have the same struggles that, that we both did. Many things have happened to Jerry in the last year, and not all of them are, or not all of them are pleasant. Jerry's life reflects the challenges that, pe uh, that people face, people of faith face, when they speak out publicly and renounce their former beliefs. Jerry DeWitt is a personal friend of ours, and to all of us, and a statesman in every sense of the word, he is an inspiration to people all over the world, clergy and laypersons, who are struggling with their beliefs but don't know where to turn. He is living proof that talent and charisma and the ability to have a strong, powerful voice are not God-given, but are natural gifts. Please welcome to the stage another big-time national newsmaker returning to Little Rock for his third appearance, our very own adopted family member. We love you, my brother, Jerry DeWitt. Well, good morning. I asked to not be hooked up to the cordless so that I could control my voice a little bit. So if I get a little loud, just wave at me and I'll back off. But I'm probably going to end up preaching before things get done. So uh, I want to make sure I've got everybody's permission in case it comes out. Is it all right? By show of hands, will it be all right to preach? Everybody else get the hell out. <clears throat> it just comes natural. I can't help it. I, I'm truly, truly, truly honored to be here. Uh, Arkansas and the Arkansas group really is my home away from home. When all of this crap first broke, oh, is that a bad word? When, when all of this stuff um, first started, now a year ago this month, I actually posted on the internet a picture of me, my son, and someone named Richard Dawkins on Facebook. And I uh, thought I could get away with it, and obviously I did not, or I would not be here this, you know, this morning. But uh, for about a year now, um, I've been speaking, and one of the very first groups that I spoke to was the Arkansas group. And so I want to say, I'm in a, <clears throat> you'll have to forgive me, I'm kind of in a weepy mood this morning. It's been, uh, it's been a long, long journey, and so if I cry, you'll just have to cry with me, or look the other way, or do something to put us all in a better mood. But it really is important for me to be here personally. It's, it is a homecoming. So... Before I get too emotional, my talk this morning is very simple. Um, I do want to attempt to convince you of a couple of ideas. And what I want to convince you of is that there actually is critical thinking in the clergy. And I know that may be hard to believe, but if it was not true, then obviously I would not be here. If you know anything about my story, and how many of you already know my story? Hell, let's go to lunch. Um, if you know anything about my story, then you know that I was in the ministry for 25 years and I left Christianity literally kicking and screaming. I did everything that I could intellectually. I did everything that I could emotionally. I worked with my conscience in every way possible to try to not only stay in Christianity but to also stay in the ministry because I truly could not envision a life any other way. And as you already know, in May of last year, uh, actually, April of last year, I came to my point of no return. In May of last year, like Teresa, I made contact with the clergy project and found out there were many other people out there just like me. And if you want to know what happened prior to that, then I will say you need to get this postcard that's out on this table that also says Hope After Faith because that is my book that's being released June of next year. That's a good place to clap your hands. 
And so you can find out how I got in such a predicament before that. But along with learning about the clergy project, now just back up with me for just a minute. I'm not going to keep you too long because I really, if it's okay, I'd like to take questions. Is that going to be all right for me to take some questions if we've got time? What you need to understand about me is, is that I had spent my entire life doing one thing, and it is my proposition that I want to put before you this morning. I believe that ministers are meaning machines. That's what they crank out 24 hours a day. That's their connection to the lives of people that they love so dearly. And if you don't think they love them, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I know I've got preacher's hair, but I'm not a televangelist. I'm not talking about televangelists, and I'm not even talking about mega church pastors because that's not my experience. My experience is the local church. You know, a few hundred people or less. I'm talking about the people who actually, the ministers who actually come to your house whenever you call them. I'm talking about the ministers that go to the emergency room or stand by the bedside in the hospital holding the hand of the surviving spouse as the spouse's loved one leaves our reality. I'm talking about true, genuine ministers. My contention is, is that these ministers are there in people's lives to provide meaning. Now I'm going to wrap all of that together before the end of this thing, but you have to understand that I had spent 25 years, not just in a career, but in a mission. I cannot tell you, to, I, I wish that I could say that I love all of you more that I love the people in my congregation, but that's just not true. Because I love you with all of my heart, and I loved them with all of my heart. And every trial, religious word, every struggle that they went through, that was my trial, and that was my struggle. Every heartache, every heartbreak, every sickness, all of that belonged to me. And so when I came to this crossroad and realized that my conscience would no longer allow me to be a minister, I kid you not, it was the end of my life. I truly thought that I would do nothing more than work a secular job from 9 to 5, come in and watch American Chopper on the DVR, and wait for the nursing home, and then eventually die. I really thought it was the end of the world. I, I, I kid you not, I had no vision of how to carry on life without being deeply involved in other people's lives. My entire identity, every bit of pleasure, Every bit of excitement that I had about life was wrapped up in loving other people. And I had no idea that that existed anywhere else. Do you realize that what you're doing today, the reason it will change lives is not just because you're standing in protest to a country that is going in the wrong direction, but it's because you are supplying the community, thus the meaning that people like me were so desperately looking for and always trying to be involved in. Can I get a Darwin? <laughs> Darwin, there's, there's one or two. And so as I came to this crossroads and I ran into the clergy project very similar to the way that Teresa had, I didn't know that all of you existed. I didn't know that there was a life outside of this, outside of the one that I'd been living. And so as Sky has already alluded to, in October of last year, I went to my first free thought convention in Houston, Texas. It's where I took the picture with Richard Dawkins and had the pleasure of seeing Christopher Hitchens make his last and most beautiful presentation. It was truly life-changing for me. And I'll be honest, I was so naive that when I walked into that convention and there was a thousand or so people there, I thought that religion was dead. I really thought that there should be an epitaph somewhere being engraved and that we would all attend religion's funeral the next week because to me, I was so naive and so fresh to the idea that there was another way of living. I didn't know that there was any other way to exist. And so Dr. Del Rey, how many of you know Dr. Del Rey, the God virus? You need to look it up. Write it down right now. We'll pause for a minute. Get your pens. No. <laughs> Dr. Del Rey with the God virus, he approached me and told me about recovering from religion and asked me if I would be the director. And what's very, very honorable and pleasurable for me today is to say that Central Arkansas, the recovering from religion branch of Central Arkansas, is announcing its revitalization today. Can I get a Darwin? So if you 
find yourself after today's event somewhat in transition, trying to figure out what it's all about and how do you rearrange your life after you leave religion. Because we know that inside a religion, that's one of the things it does very well. Whenever you have a question, it has an answer, right? And I was the pastor, so if I didn't have the answer, I'd make one up. That's what you were paying me for, to try to supply meaning, because ministers are meaning machines. But we now know that it doesn't work that way, and it's not that simple. So in recovering from religion, we give a transitional period. We like to baby the people that most of you like to debate. You'd be surprised how many people no longer believe in God, but still go to bed every night afraid of going to hell. And it doesn't seem possible. But you have to remember that our brains are constantly being wired by our environment. And if you've been brought up in a home where all of those things are just as commonplace and make just as much sense as the sky is blue and the stovetop is hot, then it's going to be hard to let go of those things as you get older. So recovering from religion is a safe place for everyone, just like the clergy project is a safe landing place for ministers who never, no longer hold to their supernatural beliefs. This is the groups, and there's been more groups added since then for recovering from religion. So what this has allowed me to do, does anybody recognize this place? So what this has allowed me to do, this story of a preacher, and I don't say losing my faith, because I don't feel like I lost anything. I've lost car keys, right? I've even lost a couple of cats. But I didn't lose my faith. I'm here to say that I graduated from religion, that I took the course very seriously, and I took my fellow students to heart, and I studied as hard as I could, and I applied myself for 25 years, and I feel like I didn't lose anything, but instead I graduated from religion. And thank you. There was a few little hand claps. In a moment, we're going to have an exercise, and we're going to find out, you know, where everybody's really at so just stay with me and so this story's been sensational and it's allowed me to travel the country and go to many beautiful places and also allowed me to speak at the American Atheist Convention the day after the Reason Rally it's also allowed me to express myself as I traveled around and spoke to different types of groups I quickly realized that we were all on the same page but we all wanted to title the chapter something different Right? Whether it's skeptics or free thought or humanist, I don't care. You know, you can say what you want to say, but I'm, I'm big into unity. And everybody is truly on the same page, whether you want to be on the page with me or not. And so I thought, how can I express myself that brings everyone together? And what I began to realize was, was that I really did belong to skeptic groups because I was a skeptic. And actually, skepticism had always been my nature. And it was okay for me to belong to free thought groups because free thought had always been my methodology. What I would say to you this morning is, is that ministers are actually engaging in critical thinking and they're actually involved in their own form of free thought. Well, how can that be true? Well, if they're Pentecostal and not Baptist, that means they have probably looked at the Baptist doctrine and discredited it. They just haven't looked at their Pentecostal doctrine, right? If they think that Catholics aren't Christians, but only Protestants are, then they've probably stepped back and used a little bit of critical thinking to make an analysis of other people's doctrines. What you are doing, I'm, I'm going to preach here for a second, so you better get ready to rock the house with me, all right? What you are doing is you are creating an atmosphere that can become attractive to people who are looking outside of their box. You don't necessarily need people like me to be questioning Pentecostalism, where I came from, because they're already engaged in questioning all these other things. What you have to do is to do exactly what you're doing. Continue to meet. Continue to form these beautiful events. Continue to push your movement forward. Continue to be beautiful humans. And in so doing, they will stumble across you as they're looking for truth. Can I get a Darwin? So free thought actually exists. And I would say to you that the majority of ministers that I have 
learned to love over the last 25 years or 43 years of life, they're actually agnostic and they don't know it. They really are. They're actually agnostic and they don't know it. They don't understand what that means. And as Teresa explained so beautifully this morning, they are afraid of allowing their doubts to really surface. But they've got them. When you stand by the bedside of someone who's leaving this world, and it is your responsibility, you're the only hired hand in the room. This is a tithe payer. This is a faithful family. This is a husband and wife that never failed to show up and bring something for the bake sale. This is a person who had your back when other people in the congregation were being critical. These are people who are devoted to God, devoted to the church, and devoted to you. And now the greatest tragedy that they can experience is happening, and it's completely out of their control. And the doctors have done everything they can, and you're God's representative standing right there in the valley of the shadow of death, and they are looking to you for answers. I promise you, every minister on the planet with a heart for his congregation is agnostic at that moment. Because he doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know whether the person's going to live or die. He's going to pray as sincerely as he can. He's going to pull out every single tool out of his toolbox. He's going to use every weapon in his arsenal against this negative emotion, against this horrifying event, and he's going to try to uplift and he's going to try to console. He's going to try to do everything he can. But when that person passes away, as that minister walks down that hallway, there are going to be hidden tears. There's going to be a silent breaking of a heart. And that man or woman of God who stands responsible in that situation is going to say, Where are you, God? Why have you forsaken me? Every minister is a meaning machine. I realized that agnosticism was my conclusion. Not just after studying the Bible. Now, I, I, I'm, I, I'm just going to be me for a minute, okay? All of you intellectuals, you got it going on. That's great. Continue to convert every nerd and geek that you can find. <laughs> right? That's awesome. That's great. I mean, literally. You know, I mean, I, I, it wouldn't matter if Richard Dawkins was, you know, reading the brands of toilet paper that was, you know, available at Brookshire Brothers. I would listen to it. All right? I love it, just like everybody else loves it. But the truth is, real life, real life is about not being able to pay your bills. Real life is about hoping that this horrible thing with your kid works out and that he doesn't fail the fourth grade. Real life is about you're married, you're in this relationship, and it's all going to hell, and you don't know how to stop it. You don't know how to fix it. Real life is not about encyclopedias. Real life, I'm sorry, you can, you know, I, I'll never come back if you don't want me to. But real life is not about the high and mighty concepts. Real life is about what does this moment mean for real people in real situations. And after 25 years, 25 years of studying religion, not just intellectually, but emotionally, then I came to the conclusion that after 25 years of preaching, I had more questions than answers. And I promise you, every single minister with a heart is in the same situation. Does that make sense to you this morning? It has to. Now, obviously, after studying, after getting a hold of, we've got two beautiful examples of how a podcast can change lives in the lineup today. After being exposed to blogs like JT's, after learning the answers behind things that I was told were unanswerable, after that, well then I moved into more of an intellectual appreciation. And so I say that atheism is my opinion. But that's not nearly as important as understanding that humanism had always been my motivation. And that's where you're going to save the preacher. The spirit, pardon the 
terminologies, the spirit of this particular event. Don't get me wrong. I think everybody needs to have a YouTube channel. Everybody needs to take after this however they are. If you're an angry atheist, then go be as angry as you can be on the internet. It's going to do something good for somebody, I promise you, right? We're always going to have a place for Christopher Hitchens in our world. Can I get a Darwin? <laughs> that gets you a Darwin. Great. <laughs> But I would say to you that from my perspective, in the South, in the Bible Belt, reaching people like me, the attitude that you've got, this bridge building that you've expressed already in Sky's introduction, showing this beauty of humanism, showing that there is actually hope after faith. Everybody say, that's the name of his book. <laughs> now I can see why you're all atheists. You don't mind worth a damn. Showing this beautiful humanism. Showing that what this is really about is loving truth and loving people. is what's going to help that minister make the final turn. So a lot of wonderful things have happened in the last year. One of my favorite, you probably can't make it out very well. If you came up close to the screen, you might would think that that is Santa Claus at the podium. But it's actually Daniel Dennett. How many knows who Daniel Dennett is? Ah, good, good, good. Daniel Dennett sent me an email several months ago and said, I heard the Living After Faith podcast where you preached your sermon at the American Atheist Convention. Would you mind if I used your five stages from theism to atheism in my presentation in Australia at the Global Atheist Convention? And I was like, well, you know, am I going to get any royalties off of it? Is there going to be... <laughs> I was like, sure, you could do it. So this is actually his slide. And if you notice very closely, he misspelt my name. <laughs> There's just always something to balance life out, right? You know, it just always has an equalizer. So since it's Daniel Dennett who did it, I'm thinking about actually changing the spelling. <laughs> it's allowed me to meet my heroes. This is Dan Barker, who I call my own personal Jesus. Because he answered the call. It's allowed me, this is from the front page of the Times-Picayune, uh, the biggest paper in Louisiana. Yes, people do read in Louisiana. Keep your jokes to yourself. <laughs> so, just like the Clergy Project has brought, I see you over there. Just like the Clergy Project has brought attention to Teresa, I've been the fortunate recipient. This is CNN. And then, of course, last but not least, the New York Times. So... What I'm very proud to announce is, is that this New York Times article written by Robert Worth came out August the 22nd, had publishers actually contacting me and literary agents contacting me. And so I will tell you, that's not going to be the case for everybody, obviously. Not everybody's going to get a book deal out of a tragic story. But I am here to assure you that even without the book deal, that there is hope after faith. Because what we were in religion, we were humanists who didn't know what humanism was. And once we shed ourselves of all of the extra trappings of religion, and we fr free ourselves completely from all the supernatural thinking, the first thing that happens is we begin to enjoy humanism at its fullest. Completely unencumbered. No longer do we have an Old Testament God that we have to justify killing entire tribes of people just so that, you know, another tribe can get a piece of land. No longer do we have to justify discrimination even within the New Testament. No longer do we have to sit back and wait for a phone call from the pastor, from the man of God, to tell us if it's okay to believe this way or to think that way or to vote. For the first time, when we free ourselves completely from the shackles of religion, we embrace true hope, the true hope that can only be enjoyed by humanists as they enjoy serving humanity. Can I get a Darwin? Yeah, I hear a couple of raw men's. Get over it. Darwin. <laughs> and so did it come at a price? Of course it did. It came at a great price. I live in a town of 10,000 people. 
And I not only had pastored two different churches, not only had I been a minister in that community for 25 years, but I also was the director of community services and the mayor's chief of staff. And the reason I was hired for that position is because everybody thought that he was an infidel who loved to drink, play jazz music, and owned a condo in New Orleans. And so they said, we need to stick a preacher in his administration. And so I'm definitely the odd man out. Just the other day, as I was getting this jacket back from the cleaners, for the second time, I had to tell them to not give me the minister's discount. <laughs> the second time, at the same cleaners, that I had to explain that I was no longer a minister and that I did not want the minister's discount. That's how small the community is. Along with the loss of favor within the community, I almost lost my home. We went into foreclosure, and I saved it by filing bankruptcy but my son and I still live in the same home. But along with it was not only the loss of friends and the loss of finances and the loss of favor, but has also been the loss of family. This last straw of ostracism within our small community was more than my wife could bear, and she would tell you very quickly she didn't leave me, but she left a very bad situation. And so there's been a great price to pay. And so that's why I think that I can so I think I can stand here today and tell you that even after all of that, there must be hope after faith. Or how else would I have the strength to be here? The clergy project and members like myself receive a great deal of criticism. Because there's that transitional period where ministers are trying to work their way out, they're trying to move into another life, they're trying to find out how all of this works, they're called liars and charlatans and cowards. And I will tell you that these men and women who are still behind the pulpit, even though they know with all of their heart that they no longer believe the supernatural doctrines of their religion, these are far from cowards. And they know that what they're doing is a form of a lie. But it's the kind of lie that you tell to keep your spouse with medical insurance. Because this is what you've done all your life and you don't have another way of getting insurance and if she doesn't get her medicine, she will die. It's the kind of lie that you tell in order to help your kids get through college and to have a better life than what you've had. It's the kind of lies that you tell because your spouse knows this tragic, ugly secret within your life and is begging you not to tell a single person because it's going to not only embarrass her or him, it's going to embarrass their family and it's going to embarrass them in the community and they threaten you with divorce if you make this public move. Along with that, there are others that step in and criticize. Facebook has been a lot of fun, let me tell you. But I'll encourage you and say that there's hope after faith and for another great reason because many of the people within my community that have attacked me on Facebook, when this same tall, good-looking guy <laughs> Whenever I meet them at the grocery store, the same ones who've talked ugly, they embrace me with a hug at best or avoid me at worst because they're not brave enough and they're not strong enough to overcome my love. And they know that what I've done, I've done because I love truth and I love humans. Can I get a Darwin? So, Here's my proposition to you. My proposition is, is that all ministers are skeptics in some form or fashion. That all ministers are engaging in free thought. And that all ministers ultimately end up being agnostic. And what we have to do is we have to help free them. This is an odd message to preach, so stay with me. We have to free them from this religious roundabout. Because modern day Christianity has built in some horrible traps through their loopholes called faith. Because whether you know it or not, modern day Christianity does not require you to actually truly from your heart believe anything. Because that's not faith. Faith is not walking by sight. Faith is not about knowing something. Faith is about acting as if you know something. Does that resonate with anybody? 
Faith is not about getting up in the morning and saying, I know for a fact that a Jewish carpenter 2,000 years ago died, was and resurrected three days later. That, that's not faith. Faith is acting like you know that. Faith is what adults normally call pretending. <laughs> right? And so the minister, as he gets to the top of the curve, and he realizes he's agnostic, and he's walking from one unsuccessful prayer meeting in the hospital room to another prayer meeting where he has to pull himself back together, put back on a positive smile, right? I mean, just imagine how heartless and selfish you would have to be as a minister to walk out of this room knowing that this patient isn't any better and walk into the next room where everyone is looking at you for hope and saying, well, hell, I'll be honest with you. I don't know if this is going to work or not. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, sister. I, I wish your husband the best, but I'm kind of down today. I'm a little disappointed. You know, I just come from down the hall and Brother John passed away and I really thought he's going to make it. You know, we had that prophecy that came out Wednesday night. The evangelist said, thus saith the Lord, he's going to live and not die. And, and I really thought it was going our way. So, I mean, I'll pray if you want to, but I don't know what God's up to, right? <laughs> you know, it's not going to work. And at that moment in that minister's life, it's not the humane thing to do because he feels the weight of these people's lives resting upon his shoulder. The only glimmer of hope that he knows to share at that moment is to fake it. And so he takes a deep breath and he pushes his own sadness and his own disappointment a little further back and he walks in and says, we know God is a healer. We know God can do anything. We know that God loves us. We know that by His stripes we're healed. And He pushes it forward one more time. And what He does at that moment is He makes a left-hand turn and He begins to loop once again around the religious roundabout. Because it's not about what He believes, but it's about how He acts. And the reason that He continues to act that way is because there are three things that are extremely important to Him. Community, consolation, and of course, conscience. And out of his devotion, everybody thinks these preachers are in it for the money. Let me tell you, the majority of churches in the United States, the last statistic I saw was that over 70% of the churches in the United States have less than 100 members. Nobody's getting rich with 100 members. Okay? Nobody feels like they're making all the money that they should make whenever they're getting out of their bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, driving across town, and spending the rest of the day standing in an emergency room with someone. Nobody thinks they're getting paid enough for that. This isn't about money. It may be about responsibilities that involve money. It may be about family. It may be about relationships. But more than anything, it's about community. And so they make this left-hand turn again because they don't know there's another community. Whether they know it statistically or not, they know from their instinct that this network, this community, when somebody is sick, the fact that people will bring them a casserole, that that puts meaning in people's lives. They know instinctively that when someone misses church and they get a call, not just from the pastor but from somebody in the church, that they feel love and they feel important. They know instinctively that community... It's what helps us all survive this very rough road called life. And it's rough for everyone. And they don't know there's another community, so they turn left instead of right. That's why I say to you that you are the saving grace for ministers. Because with this event, you are demonstrating community. And if you'll just keep growing, if you'll keep being persistent, then they're going to stumble across your community. Can I get a Darwin? <laughs> Beyond that, the minister is a meaning machine. And his life is around the concept of giving consolation. The person passes away, and he's able to say they're in a better place. Right? Now they're with the Lord. They're able to look at a surviving spouse and say, Brother John lived his whole life for this moment. And they're able to try to bring a momentary sense of peace. But there's hope after faith. Because the reality of it is, is that you possess the only real consolation that there is in life. The skeptical world, the secular ideology, the humanist 
mission and vision is the only true consolation that exists. What I love about now being away from my religion and having graduated from faith is that I still feel in awe of reality and of the universe even whenever I open my eyes. Darwin. <laughs> whenever I stand on a starry night and I look out into the beauty of the Milky Way and I feel like I can actually see that creamy film that surrounds us. Something, right? Something instinctual, something beautiful, something larger than life that now I know isn't divine and isn't supernatural and isn't trapped between the leather pages of a book, right? But something so inspiring for truly, a lack of better words, fills my heart and then penetrates my mind. And for the first time, I'm able to look at the universe and see my place in it and not see it as the enemy, not see it as just a machine that has now been tainted by sin and is attempting to pull me astray and take me the wrong direction. It's no longer the enemy, but now it is me and I am it. And I think about starships one day piloted by scientists, humanists, spreading out across the galaxy and life not ending at the end of this year but instead life going on for as long as there is a universe there's hope after faith I'll be honest it's hard to make that move from being told that when you die you're gonna live forever and then to say well the consolation is is that now you get to really live life fun it's kind of like someone thinking that their scratch-off said a million dollars, right? And you look at it for them and say, no, that actually says a thousand dollars. But hey, you got a thousand dollars you didn't have. And they're like, oh, whoopee, great. <laughs> but the reality of it is, it is great. It is beautiful. Would I love to go on and on and exist somewhere else? Under certain circumstances. But what I really love is to be able to express this hope that I now have in facets of my life that I've never been free to enjoy before. I'm going to say my own Darwin. Eh, hand claps. So, last but not least, what's working on these ministers is conscience. And that's something none of us have control over. But if you'll keep doing what you're doing, if you'll keep posting the videos and the podcast, if you'll keep writing the blogs, if you'll keep having meetings, if you'll keep elevating the consciousness of the United States of America in the freaking 21st century we're having to fight this battle, if you'll keep elevating the consciousness, then it will work on their conscience. Because they're going to see in you the integrity that they were taught to demonstrate. They're going to see in you the love for truth that they were taught to pursue. And they're going to see in you the love for humanity that they themselves have always had. There is hope after faith. That's all I got. So I know we started late. Can we take like maybe two questions? Would that be too many? Is it? Or I'll repeat the questions. Whatever you want to do. Uh, I see. see. Okay. Yeah, we got my. We got a mic here. I see a, a hand right over there. Thanks. I think you make a really important point, and I just wanted to say it the way that I understood it: that the opposite of reason is not emotion. Mm. And the opposite of reason isn't even faith. The opposite of reason is unreasonableness. <laughs> right, that's right. That's the opposite of that's reason. That's right. That's right. Darwin. Yeah. So I, I wonder if you had a, a, yeah. a comment on that. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. What I, what I immediately ran into, and, and right after the last question, I'm going to take 15 seconds to preach for y'all. Um, what I immediately ran into because of, you know, southern Louisiana, flamboyantness. I, I immediately ran into this wall of, oh, we don't want emotion. Emotion bad, right? Because like I'm going to hypnotize you and I'm going to make you all 
give, you know, I've got empty pockets or something, you know, and I'm going to make you all bend to my will. And, and, and what the analogy that I made was, and I remember doing this in, in Arizona, there was a, just literally a room full of scientists. And I said, how many of you think that you understand biology? And of course, everybody, oh, you know, I understand biology. And I said, how many of you think you understand sexuality through biology? Oh, all right. I said, okay, well then, no more, no more foreplay, no more candles, no more sexy music, right? Marvin Gaye's got to go out of the room, right? Because since you understand it, then why have emotion, right? If you understand the science, then why have, why have emotion? And that's where I think we're missing. That's what I think is, is the next phase that we're moving into with the secular movement is that it's going to be, there's two things that are going to become okay. It's going to be okay to be emotional, right? And it's going to be okay to give money, right? Giving money is not religion. Giving money is giving money. You know, I mean, if honestly, if you haven't donated for this event, these events cost lots and lots of money. So don't think you're being, you know, tricked into some religious maneuver by giving money. No, you're, you're paying your part. But I agree with you. Last question. I see a hand. I saw a hand over there, and then I see a lady over here. So whichever you want to choose. Uh, just a little comment on your scratch cards uh, example you, you gave, because uh, you know I'm a recent deconvert, and uh, one of the things is, you know, it's all those promises that we have, and they're beautiful. And you want to live that, yeah. but at the same time, I do want to live a, a lie. Right. And. Um, you know, there's reality. Yes. As painful as it may sound, the scratch card, you get a thousand dollars, you know. Right. Right. You don't get a million. Exactly. That's right. That's right. I, I couldn't agree more. And and what it does for you whenever you accept that this is the only life that you've got. When you finally when I say accept, I don't mean it in the faith sense of the word. I mean when you finally let that part you know, you give, you know, you give in to that reality that you know, as we always say, you don't convert to atheism, you don't convert to non-belief, you realize that's what you were, right? And so when you realize that that's what you know to be true, is that it's this one life, it really does change everything because it takes you from being a passive participant in a religion, it causes you then to be progressive, it causes you to be um, more uh, you have more perseverance, and you take it seriously. Those little vacations, those little moments, those times with your children, all of that becomes just that much more precious. And that's what every freaking self-help book on the shelf is trying to get you to do anyway. And the only way that you do it is to get free of all the other junk. That's what helps you get there, what helps me get there. Yeah. You're standing next to somebody, so we're we taking another one? Okay. This may be a little bit of a personal question, but my dad is a Southern Baptist minister here. I grew up uh, in the Philippines for 10 years where I was a missionary kid. And he owns a uh, Christian publishing com company, just got a big deal with Billy Graham and Lifeway Ministries. And he's on the uh, Southern Baptist uh, convention at Southwestern Seminary. And um, so he doesn't know that I'm actually you know, atheist and questioning. <laughs> um, I'm pretty good at keep deleting my uh, computer history. And um, anyway, my question is, I love my parents a lot. They're great people. They're very fundamentalist and dogmatic about what they believe. How can I be a continue, continue to be a loving daughter without stamp, stomping on what they've created their entire lives? So, that's a great question. So, I'm, I'm going to do something that um, ministers are not always allowed to do. I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. And I don't know how for you to do that. Um, it, it is probably the most common and most heartbreaking scenario that, that I encounter. All I can say is, I've got two quick little points. One is, be as absolute loving to them as you can. I hate to sound like you're manipulating, but I mean, I would go out of my way, you know, to not take anything for granted and just, which is a good thing to do anyway, right? And just be as loving to them as you can. And 
continue if you're comfortable with it. Some people, some people are, are like a lot of times we run into college kids, all right, and their college is being paid for by believing parents. And I'll be honest with you, we tell those college kids, don't let your parents know. Get your education first. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just no way around it because, I, you know, you, you, can, you can criticize my opinion on that as much as you want, but this college experience and the education is going to shape the rest of their life. And so if they need another six months or another four years to get that done, I think it's that important. Maybe some people don't agree. But if you're not in a position, if the only thing at Jeopardy is the relationship, my, my opinion is, is that you can't love anybody the way that they really need to be loved by you until you're loving yourself enough to be yourself. And so it's a balancing act. You don't have to throw anything in their face. You don't have to push it on them. You continue to love them as much as you can love them. And you, hopefully, they will come across this understanding about you gradually after a certain length of time. And then they have to look back at that history and say, well, you know, man, she was not a believer, you know, last October. That was a whole year ago and she hasn't acted any different. You know, I mean, all the chickens are in the yard. She hasn't had a sacrifice yet. You know, I mean, you know, everything, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't true. But honestly, there's just not a good answer because this, this is a very real test of human integrity. I don't, if there is a good answer, anybody have a good answer? Okay, good. Well... I've got just a small moment to tell you that this has been such a grand adventure. I found myself down in such a low place. I was all alone, trapped. I'm going to tell you, brother. I found myself trapped and alone. Feeling as if there was absolutely no hope. I'd gone near and far. I thought I'd looked around. There was so much that I thought I understood. But little did I know that my mind was completely filled with all of the wrong things. Religion had completely baptized me in falsehoods. But as religion began to dry me off and I began to shake myself completely free. Not partially free. Not just a little free. But as I began to get myself completely free, I began to feel something firm under my my feet. I had always stepped around in mushy places trying to justify things that were hard to explain. But at this moment, whenever I've caused all the dust to be spread out of my feet, I realized I was standing on a rock. Yes, my friends, there was a rock and it was a rock of reason. I want you to understand that today you're changing the future. You're making life better and there is hope after faith. Can I get a Darwin? Thank you, Brother Jerry. <laughs>